Advances Committee of the HIFA, and he's a media enough, person. Muhammad. Thank you. This is enough. Please <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Please. So uh, we uh, uh, okay. So uh, he's uh, a very long list of uh, organizations and uh, uh, um, uh, authorities that he uh, uh, um, uh, joined, and uh, you all. I, I hope that you all know uh, his um, um, great. Uh, uh, participation being uh, the president of our conference that we, that held for uh, five times in Egypt, uh, the last one in February. And we hope all you uh, uh, enjoy his uh, lecture as uh, usual. Uh, please, Dr. Yaqub, he will uh, address the uh, uh, topic of clinical tools to improving success, safety, and efficiency of IVF. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Mohammed, and thank you for this unnecessary introduction. Uh, it is a great pleasure always to be interacting with colleagues. And it's always tempting to use a very ambitious title. Because if you think about the individual words of this title, I'm expected to cover clinical tools that could improve success, safety, and efficiency of IVF. That's effectively encompassing everything that IVF stands for. It is hard task, but I will use the opportunity to just highlight few aspects related to success, related to safety and related to efficiency and how can they move forward and improve as best as we can. So there is no IVF without a patient and the patient in terms of how we handle them before they start and what success look like and what safety, safety look like and what efficiency look like. And hopefully we will get together to appreciate the whole profile. To predict success over the past 40 years of IVF, we have come to appreciate that woman's age is the be all or end all. There is nothing that supersedes women's age as far as biology is concerned. The number of previous attempts, if the patient is seeing you for the first time, is slightly different from having tried four or five times somewhere else. And the patient who had a pregnancy before, particularly if it's a live birth, particularly if it's an IVF live birth, then will have much higher chance than someone who is just treatment naive. The National Institute for Healthcare Excellence expect women to have certain BMI really for them to optimize their treatment and the government will not pay for any woman whose BMI is over 30. And where some lifestyle factors are also contradictory to success like maternal and paternal smoking, NICE stipulates that those couples, if one or both of them are smoker, they will not be entitled to state funding. Luckily, they don't include caffeine consumption as an exclusive criteria, and the relationship between caffeine consumption and success rate is less evident, but when it comes to smoking and obesity, it is straightforward. We get sometimes men feeling left out because we all the time focus on the woman, so they would like to feel important or as important, but still, they are not as important to the equation in biological term as women. And therefore, even age of men does not have that tangible impact on success, although it has been suggested that with older women, with older men, there could be increased risk of miscarriage or autosomal dominant conditions such as Huntington disease and all of these adult onset disease. These are all tenuous relationships. Autism spectrum disorders in the offspring, and it is also been suggested that kids may have schizophrenia later. I would ignore this speculative assumption, but we focus on women's age. So age of the woman is the most important prognostic factor for success. How we prepare the couple for treatment? Because I'm sure you would agree with me that this is the crucial time to account for all the factors that in our knowledge and experience are important so that we can get the planning right. Because I'm a believer that failing to plan is planning to fail. 
whether it is in medicine or in life. If you don't put your energy and invest in planning the treatment, you will not get the optimum effect. If we start always with the basic, in gynecology in general, 80% of diagnosis can be made by history alone. So just to show you how history is important in highlighting important aspect of woman's story that could, or man for that uh, matter, that could interfere with the um, treatment. Previous surgery, medical issue that need to be seen to, current and previous treatment, what happened, response, uh, lack of it, success, lack of it, miscarriage, eh, all, of, all of that could be an important factor. And we do the gynecological examination, including speculum examination, and some of us will contemplate doing a trial or what we call mock embryo transfer. I am not one for routine, because doing embryo transfer as a routine is not really necessary. If you know that your patient has regular menstrual cycle, has not had cervical surgery, has not had any pelvic surgery, probably ultrasound will give you an idea about this uterus is not extremely antiverted, it's not extremely retroverted. You don't need to go through this and there are techniques to do later. It will be important also opportunity to see to issues that need some handling before embarking on IVF, whether it's PCOS, obesity, adenomyosis, thyroid disease, endometrioma, uh, hydrosalpinx, fibroid, polyp, and uterine anomalies, and make a considered judgment because not all of this list need to have drastic treatment. You could see an endometrioma, but you do nothing about it. And doing nothing is the best thing you can do. Because if you go chasing after an endometrioma that is three centimeters, that's not symptomatic, you are certain to do more harm than good. Equally, if the patient has seven, you know, very impressive seven centimeter subserosal fibroid, you just leave well alone. Does not need any interference before IVF and so on and so forth. The same applies to uterine anomalies. It is not really having a unicorn uterus. If you are treating a patient with IVF does need nothing. Having a bicornic uterus does need nothing. It's just you are aware of it. Perhaps when the patient is pregnant, you might consider putting a suture later, particularly with multiple pregnancies. This is a time where patients always ask, how can we prepare ourselves for successful treatment? And there are people who indulge into prescribing everything that goes. Have omega-3, have Q enzyme 10, have vitamin, um, uh, multivitamins, have all of that. Unfortunately, that is just a little bit of a radical approach that should not be adopted. If you have a healthy woman who is living a, a healthy lifestyle, all of that other than folic acid, not to improve success, but to reduce the incidence of neural tube defect. And in some group of women might need higher dose of five milligram rather than the usual 400 microgram. We will come to this later. There are the tendency to go further than what your clinical examination and ultrasound gives you. And this is a very controversial topic. We debated it only two nights ago. And should we do hysteroscopy for every woman? Because we must make sure that the cavity of the uterus is fine. We assume and we agree that even the uterus should be treated as innocent until proven guilty. And most of those women will have a perfectly healthy uterus and when we did the ultrasound scan, the endometrium was straight, regular, triple line. There is no need to go over the top and do it. And here is the evidence that has been uh, uh, produced. And you can see the clinical pregnancy is no different between the hysteroscopy or no hysteroscopy group. It is absolutely I, almost identical. And in graphic terms, those who had hysteroscopy in the the red line and those who didn't have hysteroscopy in the blue line and you can see they are identical in the chances of success or having a pregnancy. So routine hysteroscopy take it from me out of the way. You only do it if you have suspicion of uterine abnormality. If you can see a fibroid that you don't know whether it's inside the cavity or not, if you are keen to do and you are good at treating, you can see and treat at the same time after counseling the patient. If you're not good at treating, confirm it by saline sonography and then you send it to someone who does know what they're doing. So women with a normal transvaginal ultrasound should not be offered routine hysteroscopy no matter 
what other advocates say. It is an opportunity to counsel the patients about why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we offering here intra, uh, sorry, IVF for ICSI, not intrauterine insemination? Why we are not starting here with ovulation induction because it's clear that her issue is anovulatory and she has polycystic ovarian syndrome and it is perfectly reasonable to treat it with anything less than IVF because in medicine, you start with less invasive, less expensive and less demanding first. You describe the st steps of the procedure because hopefully it will help compliance, understanding, the patient will be engaged and so on and so forth. The pregnancy rates in general, in your clinic and in patients overall, but also that is specific to her condition from your learned judgment and educated estimation of how likely she would get the desired outcome. regime, if you are still using this, the patient need to know, and in this context, her husband will need to know that the woman will be having hot flushes and she will be short fuse and she will be short tempered and she will be less tolerant than normally. So at least he, poor man, prepares himself. The financial information, how much it would cost, because bringing surprises on patient can only add to the stress of the procedure. If the patient has budget, and she has made the ends meet to create this amount of money, don't spring a surprise because you have decided that something fanciful will need to be added at the last minute. And it will be helpful if you have a, a, a summary of the treatment and the important feature in Arabic for people to read or in English if your clients are from abroad. So what good preparation looks like? You need to be aware of tests and intervention that are not supported by evidence and you stay away from them and not do a laparoscopy for a patient who is not having any gynecological history suggests she would benefit and she is already going for IVF for male factor infertility. You don't do a hysteroscopy for a regular thick endometrium without any interruption or disruption in its regularity. And you have a checklist for all uh, your patients to modify what, what investigation that you do. You ensure the patient knowledge of the detail and you obtain written consent and you counsel the patient about the chances honestly, because if you exaggerate the expectations, one thing certain to happen, the patient will be disappointed at the end of it. And you need to be minded with cost effectiveness. It may sound like a number for you, but for the patient, it will be a drain on her financial resources. So what about success? We know what control success or influence success in IVF, and there is a whole host of factors. Of course, I will stay on the clinical side because it's not very often that we get the privilege of having someone of David Gardner's stature to be talking to us about the clinical side and we look forward to hearing what he will have to say. So what is success? And I would be grateful if you get hold of this slide because success means that we get better outcome, which effectively a life birth. With minimal side effects, the patient does not have to go through the procedure of going to the intensive care unit even though she's carrying a pregnancy because she developed severe late ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It's not an excuse, just she is carrying a pregnancy. It's good for the woman and for the couple because it is not fantastic if the woman delivered beautiful twins and after that she has severe postpartum hemorrhage and lost her life. The poor man will be left struggling. It is also good for the offspring having high order multiple pregnancy can never be good for offspring, no matter how much indulgence some of our colleagues will have when they hold three or four in their hand and say they are perfect. They may appear perfect to you now, but they have 17 times the chance of having cerebral palsy later. So it is important to define success. And above all, it is value for money. You did not make them 
uh, borrow money from the bank or from neighbor or sell their valuable to get there. It has to consider value for money because they don't need to pay extra that doesn't add value. So how we express pregnancy outcomes when we read studies and when we published? Some people will use live births per fresh cycle or per complete cycle or per woman. That's probably the most acceptable so far, although we're trying to do better now. I'll explain this later. What we uh, uh, consider as the ultimate here is a live birth. Some people will express it as clinical pregnancy, as biochemical pregnancy, with if no use. Having a positive test is not why the couple came to see you, but having a baby is. Currently, we would like to move a bit better by using the live birth rate, the cumulative live birth rate with fresh and frozen embryos. That is the ultimate because it will reflect how efficient with the use of the material that the couple have given you. They have given you a good number of eggs. They have given you sperm. You have fantastic lab. You create a good number of good quality embryos. You look after them. You replace one, hopefully in the fresh cycle, you have seven or eight plus assists in the freezer. How or what have you made out of these? That is a cumulative live birth. Let me get this out of the way. There will be always people who say that mild stimulation, getting fewer eggs is better. That is nonsense. The more eggs you have, the more chance of increasing your cumulative chance. It's been proven time and time again. And don't, don't call me radical, but this is a thing that does not need even proving. Because if you have the functional unit, certainly you have more embryos. And if you have your more embryos, you have more chances. So all begins, but it doesn't end with ovarian stimulation. And it's not a transaction, it is a strategy. And ovarian stimulation is essential for success. If you get it right, you are closer to achieving the objective. Safety in some scenarios, as we'll discuss later, can be very critical. Cost may be an issue. There are people who tend to associate cost with quality. It's not always the case. It doesn't mean that there is expensive medication that it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be much better. Efficiency must be considered. So you are using your medications efficiently and you are getting the result that you are uh, hoping for with efficiency too. The burden of the treatment must be reduced. So bringing the patient every day twice to the clinic can't be so clever. It's burden of the time, it's burden physically, and probably will attract financial burden with it. And sound judgment is crucial to balance benefits and risk all the time. In deciding what to do and what happens, you need that sound judgment and it is important related to ovarian stimulation strategy. We are all familiar with what happened with the long protocol where there is day 21 down regulation with whatever gene RH agonist you use. When you affect down regulation, you start stimulation. And then when you um, uh, uh, reach the maturation, uh, uh, mature follicles, you trigger ovulation and you go for egg collection. This one is the short where you start stimulation on this day two or day three of the cycle. You carry on on day six, you add the antagonist. If you are flexible, you can wait until there is follicle size 14 millimeter before starting. There are some people who use it earlier at follicle size 12. You decide what is best in your setting. And then when you reach the final stage of maturation of the follicle, you trigger and then you go with the process. And the success of your ovarian stimulation will depend on how many eggs you safely manage to get and how efficient you use these uh, eggs. Because if you had large number of eggs, that's obviously metaphorical representation. Eggs don't look like this. They look much smaller. They are one tenth of a millimeter, although it is the largest cell in the body. If you have 15 eggs and you end up with one or two embryos going back and the rest is gone with the wind, that is inefficiency in itself. But if you have many eggs, that you fertilize them effectively, you created many embryos, you have taken one to go back and the rest gone into the freezer safely, then that is efficiency. And we are privileged because you feel sorry for 
people like Bob Edward and the pioneers, the real pioneers, because everybody is now is called or calling themselves pioneers. We don't have pioneers of IVF living with us. The pioneer of IVF has died long time ago. So we are privileged to have the cryopreservation technology in its current form where it can add another life to what we do and remove that inefficiency bit from the inefficient way that would have otherwise been without the presence of cryopreservation. And cryopreservation has enabled us really to make some shift with our safety endeavor to make the process safe or safer than what we lived with maybe 15 years ago. And one of the issues that made, I call it without exaggeration, paradigm shift, because we all know that the trigger for ovarian hyperstimulation was one of the most serious complication, it is potentially life-threatening complication, is ovarian hyperstimulation. And the most key event is giving HCG, which is by definition the trigger. And it will trigger a cascade of events like the domino effect that lead to that picture you can see where HCG will release a lot of angiogenic activity. We don't know exactly. It could be VEGF, it could be other things. But the fact of the matter, all the vas vascular permeability increase, the fluid extravasation, the hydrothorax, the ascites, the generalized ascites or anosarca as a result of that trigger of HCG. And we are familiar that what happens as a result of the trigger from HCG is the early hyperstimulation, but one can be aggravated is what's coming from the HCG of pregnancy, which is the late hyperstimulation. If we block that nasty trigger, that is HCG, and we replace it by other agent that can do the function, may not be in quite the same way, but at least it will affect maturation of the eggs. And that is the GnRH agonist or what we call agonist trigger. Then all of this cascade of event will be blocked and the domino effect will not happen. And we know it works. How do we know? We know that when you use this in all the systematic reviews that have been published, there is significant, significant reduction in the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation that now it is almost a reportable case when you have ovarian hyperstimulation despite using the agonist trigger. Unless if you manage to tinker and add a bit of HCG, then I'm not responsible. But if you use only agonist trigger, it's unlikely that you have ovarian hyperstimulation. It can, but it's exceedingly rare. So if we take an example, if you have a patient who has polycystic ovaries, syndrome or otherwise, and you go with a conventional strategy, you will use small dose, because that is what we used to do, to be extremely careful and cautious. And you don't add to just a small dose this, but you will monitor response by estradiol measurement and scanning and frequently, almost every day or every other day. And then despite your best effort, you could find that after 10 or 11 days of simulation, the patient has 35 follicles or the estradiol is rocketing. Then you might make a judgment. I'm not using the full dose of the HCG. I'll use half. But the patient start to feel uncomfortable and having pain. Her ovarian is enlarged. No, no, no. Let's give her cabergoline from the day of egg collection before this happened. Or... As she is feeling unwell, let's freeze all. Secondary prevention. You can see the physical burden on the patient by coming and going and having blood tests and paying for them and having frequent scans and the anxiety and the stress that is caused when she developed ovarian hyperstimulation and you play catch up, which can never be the same as primary prevention. If you look at the current or the recommended approach, you have the courage to use a standard dose. If it's appropriate for your patient to use 150, fine. If you felt like using 225, fine. You do not necessarily needing to measure estradiol because there isn't a level of estradiol with which ovarian hyperstimulation can happen when you are using the agonist trigger. I, for one, uh, as out of curiosity, I triggered with GnRH agonist trigger with estradiol that was 67,000 picomol per liter, which 
effectively around 20,000 picograms per mil. It, it is frightening without GnRH agonists. So you have the benefit of primary prevention by using agonist trigger and using antagonists as your um, suppression regime and then freeze all in a pre-planned way and everybody is expecting and knowing what to do. The traditional strategy drawbacks, as I highlighted earlier, increased chance of cycle cancellation because if you are too careful, you could give the patient a homeopathic dose that doesn't touch her and you end canceling the cycle for poor response, which is something to be ashamed of. Someone who has the potential to give you a large number of eggs ended up empty-handed for because she responded inadequately. Or she, the patient surprise you by producing huge number of eggs and then you play catch up with the uh, secondary prevention. There is increased risk of hyperstimulation early. And if you persevered and put the embryos in that fresh cycle, you will increase the risk of late hyperstimulation. The burden of that monitoring and when you do freeze all will be less effective at OHS's prevention and may not yield the same because it is happening at the end of you trying to do costing or reduce stimulation or start with a small dose. So you are likely to end up with the same number of crops of, uh, of um, moving swiftly on to the second major complication of, my, of um, the process of IVF, which is multiple pregnancy. I know in Egypt, we are really very fond of multiple pregnancy and the more the merrier. This is just not shared in any civilized world, I'm sorry to say, because prevention is better than cure. And if you get excited about what you see on the day the patient delivered and you are delivering her yourself, you will not have seen the development of those children and the risk of mental and physical handicap that they could suffer from later. The issue is not new. This is a very comprehensive review, like nearly 15 years that was published by Bart Fauser and Nick Macklin and Paul DeVroy about the multiple births. But the world literature will tell you that with multiple pregnancy, there is six times the risk of pregnancy complication and maternal mortality is increased threefold. For twins, 47% of them will deliver prematurely, five times the risk of cerebral palsy, 17 times the risk of cerebral palsy for triplets or higher order. So when you are carrying three or four children in your hand with bride, think and spare a thought for that baby that could be mentally not uh, developing adequately later because of that potential complication. There is double the risk of disability and it is three times higher for, for triplets or higher. So it is high cost to the child, high cost to the existing family and high cost to the health services, which in some places can be next to non-existent. And here is a list. Maternal, increased risk of miscarriage, the burden of fetal reduction, pregnancy complication are all magnified. Anemia, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, gross retardation, cesarean section, uh, uh, I can't imagine how cesarean section can be increased in Egypt because it's already rocketing. Uh, postpartum hemorrhage and mortality as well. For the child, prematurity is a major event because everything follows. Low birth weight, mortality, morbidity, mal malformation, uh, cerebral palsy, long-term disability, learning difficulty, infant mortality, and adult health risk like the uh, adult, uh, the, the intrauterine onset of adult disease that uh, the Barker hypothesis of which you are aware. For the family, if the woman lost her life, then the guy will be having to live to pick up the pieces and ca care for a family he's not equipped to do. And there will be that feeling of guilt that in the quest to have a child for the family, someone sacrificed their life. If you have a sibling, that's also surviving, it becomes more of a burden. And then for whole parents, the stress and the isolation and the depression that could lead to divorce as the result of the stresses created by caring for multiple pregnancies. And nobody would like the result to be counterproductive because we wanted to help people become happy, not to bring misery to their life. It is hard to convince 
people sometimes that if you reduce the number of embryos to go back, certainly the live birth rate will be reduced. But the result from the HFA that started, we had started this campaign in 2008. And you can see two things here, that here is the number of embryos that are transferred. And the, uh, sorry, this is the multiple births. And here is a single embryo transfer has been increasing so subtle initially. And after up to 2015, the multiple births became like 13%. The, the, the uh, uh, birth rate per started cycle, look at the level for the birth rate per cycle. If anything, it has grown up because we had exercise good judgment in embryo selection. And when you put one embryo, probably you may um, uh, enhance the overall performance, but that is uh, debatable, but certainly the outlook is here. You might say this is 2015, what happens after that? I can tell you that the multiple births in the UK currently is 8%. And this has not gone down a single bit. If anything else, uh, actually it has gone this way. It is still going up. So it is not a, a given that if you replace one plus two cysts, the chances of success will take a nose dive. No, because when you put two or three, what you are increasing, you are increasing the multiple pregnancy, not the overall pregnancy chances, except by a margin, to be fair. And currently with the improvement of embryo culture and freezing and thawing method, as we see, the strategy of elective single embryo transfer and cumulative live births until live births provide an all-inclusive success rate for ART. I am not coming near anything to do with the culture condition because we have the master himself. Hello, hello, David. Hello. So, um, this is when we talk about efficiency. We would like women to be helped, to have success and to have healthy baby. We would like to do this within a quality uh, um, processes and procedure. We would like to do this without making them remortgage their house or borrow a lot of money that they can't afford to repay. There was an interesting exercise that was conducted in the United States a few years back, actually in 2010. People always like to go with recipes. So I thought I shared this with you, whether I believe in it or not, whether you believe, but it's an interesting. Um, this group have surveyed the high performing in vitro fertilization program in the US and they asked them, what do you do in your practice? And that was done by Van Boris and co-authors and they surveyed consistently high performing IVF program in the USA to try to get some good practice point. And the survey was articulated in a way to say, if you have a normal weight, 32 year old woman with normal ovarian reserve and no history of ovulatory dysfunction. What approach would you have to handle her IVF? And this group of high performing clinics, they say, we will test the patient ovarian reserve still. We will use a step down approach to gonadotrophins. And in essence, you might make a point for that because continuing with the same dose, A, it's not necessary, B, it can be related to some um, endocrine dynamics that are not particularly positive. You use, they, they, they like to use, it is an American thing for a long time, use a protocol containing both FSH and LH. And there may be something to argue because it would cover the group of people who need it, but certainly the majority of patients don't need that combination. They will recommend cycle cancellation with three or fewer mature follicles, while some other people will go for what's available, whether it's two follicles or one, even sometimes they go. And they also fan a uh, fund of measuring estradiol and sometimes they cancel based on estradiol level. They perform HCG trigger or whatever trigger when they had two lead follicles, 18 millimeter or greater. And when they compare results, they compare them according to age groups. So for women 34 or under, those group of high performing people can get 51% live birth rate. There isn't 100% and 80% that you see people branding around. For all program in comparison, they will get 37. So they appear to be getting one third higher. And that is year on year. Here is 51.3, here is 51.9 in subsequent year, 
where the other have increased by the same 1%, but they don't match this. Notice here that the average number of embryos they put is above two, but you are looking here at 2005, 2006, even in the United States, the number or the proportion of single embryo transfer have increased significantly over the years. For women aged 35 to 37, they get 40%, while this other program or the overall program can get up to 30%. So that is maintained the difference. So the point is probably take from this slide or this um, side of the presentation what you will, but that's what you say. But how can we measure how well we are doing? Or how can we get a handle on what, how well we are doing? It is knowledge, it is clear and it is agreed that you can't improve what you don't measure. And you see and sometimes hear some of our colleagues who say, I use this particular medication and it doesn't give me good result. How do you know? Just your impression about one or two cases, you may have got the wrong denominator. Because if you use that medicine in a patient who's poor responder, the medicine will make no difference. Or a patient who's old, the medicine will make no difference to the quality of her embryo. So it is important to agree something that we measure. And interestingly, and luckily for me, when I was looking to do this presentation, I found an article in press in Fertility and Sterility. Actually, it's not been published yet. And um, Dominic de Ziegler and um, other um, investigators from France, they had a go at what they would suggest. They agree with us that when you assess an ART result in a given center, you must differentiate between what you can influence and what is biology. And they also assert that the efficiency of ART greatly depend on the characteristic of the patient population. That is absolutely not contestable. Age of the female partner, duration of infertility, number of previous attempt as we discussed earlier. Irrespective of the progress accomplished in, te in technology over time, Pregnancy rate and miscarriage rate remain greatly affected by the age of the woman. So what and how to measure? The number of previous IVF attempt impact further chances as we started in the introduction. Past failure select out women who have consistently impaired ART outcome, but it's not just one cycle or two, probably beyond three or four. Patient with recurrent pregnancy losses and previous IVF failure may statistically have higher age independent and employee rate. I may not totally agree with this, but nonetheless, it may be an indicator. And they propose a model for us to use for um, how to measure. So they provide key performance indicator. And in order to account for proper comparison, you need to take female age, and you have results for patients under the age of 37, 37 to 40, and above 40. You take patients who have poor ovarian reserve, like AMH and AFC, and you take into consideration prior IFF attempt. And then we do it, but we do it in a much more simple way. We have the so-called star patients in our program. And if we have a patient younger than 35, who responded very well because she had egg reserve is good, and she produced good number of blastocysts. And we put one blastocyst back and she had blastocysts in the freezer. These are the one we call star patient. And for those patients, our expectation or benchmark is 60% um, uh, clinical pregnancy rate. When that drops, we go back and follow uh, and, and see what procedure, whether our operators are not doing it right, whether the lab has any issue, but we don't leave it without a bit of a specification. So finally, it is always interesting to visit the so-called add-ons because it's part of the efficiency. If you throw the book at your patient by giving them all the weird and wonderful, all the things that don't add value, but because you would like to feel that you have done everything for them. And I like this title that Cynthia Farquhar, who is known for the Cochrane Group and um, spent her time, life doing evidence-based medicine, said add-ons for assisted reproduction technology. Can we be honest here? Which means those who dish it out to patients regardless, and they claim that they are doing it for patient benefit, probably we need to be honest here as who is benefiting from those add-ons. So why do some clinicians 
recommend treatment add-ons, despite sometimes the evidence is not pointing to anything meaningful. Some people will tell you other clinics use them. I can't not use. Some, uh, some other clinician will tell you patient requests them and I can't refuse. And others will tell you, I use them in my patients and don't tell me about my guidelines. My experience matters. Total nonsense, of course, but you know, we, we live in real life. I, I read a paper and um, it showed that it works. If you believe every paper and you change your practice about every paper, you will be in for a shock of your life because good proportion of these papers not worth the paper written on. And or they argue there is nothing else I can do. If, you, if there is nothing else you can do, don't improvise and cause the patient in the process. If I don't do this and the treatment fails, the patient will blame it on me. I guess if you have done the best you can based on your knowledge and the experience and everything else, the patient can blame you all she likes because that's reality. I use them after the first cycle failed. Were you expecting every first cycle to succeed? That's why you are improvising. Inadequate knowledge or understanding. Uh, unfortunately, some of us are not able to tell what's a good evidence from what a dodgy one. What remains, unfortunately, that it has been uh, increasingly, people are becoming increasingly aware of this in the medical community. And this is a caption in 2017. Look at the title. When evidence says no, but doctors say yes. Long after research contradict common medical practices, patient will continue to demand them and physician will continue to deliver them. Something like assisted hatching, supposedly to be done and dusted. Again, I'm not going into the lab, but still some people are offering it. Endometrial scratching. It's not, the evidence has not been great, but people are doing it. Intravenous immunoglobulin and immune therapy treatment. Heparin being given for any, any patient doesn't add any value, but we are doing it. And even if the evidence suggests that doesn't work, patient will continue to demand them and clinician will offer them. The result is what? The result is an epidemic of unnecessary and unhelpful treatment. If we talk about effectiveness, we must always balance what is achieved against what is desired. It's not effective if we get 20% when what is desired is 60. And it is not efficient if we give the patient unnecessary burden. They add to the financial and emotional and the physical burden. And this will always go back to us using unnecessary medications. I hope I use the time allocated with maybe three minutes over time to cover some of the highlights related to success, efficiency and, um, and safety. And um, the rest of the story will be completed comprehensively by David on the lab side, and we will look forward to hearing what he has to say. Thank you.
Bush and for my sins, but the, uh, the first... I will be get drafted back to work at the beginning of the month. Okay, Dr. Yaqub, uh, Dr. Nahla asking about the dual trigger in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Yes, uh, as I you... say, if you are concerned really seriously about ovarian hyperstimulation, keep HCG out of your reach. Just stick with the agonist trigger and oh. consider freeze all, weather the storm, and the patient can come for frozen embryo transfer. Because even if you get away with the early, you may not get away with the late hyperstimulation that results from the pregnancy in that cycle. Okay. The second question uh, asking about the um, if there is a multiple gestation after ovarian stimulation, yeah. uh, is the risk of uh, maternal and fetal morbidity higher than that uh, occurring if the multiple pregnancy occur after natural conception? With natural conception, it's exceedingly rare to have triplets. But with assist conception, with the liberal replacement of many embryos, of course, it's much, much more. So the, 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 the comparison between natural and assisted conception multiple pregnancies academic and does not take away the high risk associated with multiple births regardless of its source with the mother, for the mother and for the baby. Right. For uh, another question asking about the, uh, uh, ex your experience for uh, high immature OO sites uh, in, in IVF program? You, my experience is like everybody else's experience. And it is an opportunity to, to tell you, when you are faced with a dilemma, there are no magician in the world. If you have persistently immature eggs, they will always be persistently immature eggs anywhere else. But unless if you have not used the right stuff, because I can give an example, you can use agonist trigger in a patient who has hypogonadic, trophic hypogonadism, and you did not take care of this point, you will not find any eggs mature. There will, there will be no response to that. So effectively, the trigger did not do the job. So you will get just clear fluid the following day. So it's important to appreciate that. But if you have done everything right and you're still getting mature, immature eggs, we tend to repeat it. And then we cover all grounds. We give more HCG if not the patient uh, if the patient is not at um, risk of hyperstimulation. We give even dual trigger, and we in prolong the stimulation for one or two days. All those tricks for patients who have genuine maturity issue will do nothing. But for those who have something that's corrected, you might get few other eggs. Unfortunately, we get one or two of these uh, a year, and there is nothing you can do to change their outlook. Some people. You, they try in vitro maturation. Some people you try to use um, this, but it is all really with mixed degree of success or lack of. Okay. Um, another question asking about the, uh, if you are using a vitrified sperm or uh, a fresh uh, semen sample before ICSI. Yeah. So do you use uh, uh, conventional uh, uh, fresh semen for all in the IVF cycle? Or no, no, just... no. It is what is available. So. If the guy is available to give us a fresh sample, fine. But if he is in drafted to war and he frozen sample before treatment or he's not available, he's on a long travel, we will use frozen sperm. If he doesn't have sperm in the ejaculate, we will use, fro we'll use surgical sperm, retrieve sp uh, surgically retrieved sperm. If... We can't do it fresh. We will do it ahead in a scheduled way and we freeze it and we use it in the day of treatment. That's just shared, I think, by everybody. Yeah. Yes, okay. So I uh, took the opportunity to ask a question for myself. If you have a patient who had uh, a cerebral palsy or uh, autism baby after IVF cycle, what do you recommend for her in the subsequent cycles? Uh, this patient, probably she will not think about IVF. <laughs> it will it will be scarred for life. I can people may not appreciate it. The patient I remember vividly a patient of mine. She was forty one. That was like maybe twenty years ago, and I tried to be clever and gave her one and a half ampoule of gonadotrophins to stimulate her over it, and she responded reasonably well. But still, she produced I think nineteen eggs. We put two embryos back during those days, even maybe three. And the patient had post-pregnancy test. 
But before, in the run-up to professor pregnancy test, she started developing ovarian hyperstimulation. She was admitted and had paracentesis and stay a few days. And even though she left the hospital with a baby on board and she delivered her daughter, every time she come to visit us, she still feel better. And the pain that she endured during hyperstimulation. So having a baby did not make her forget the bad experience of having hyperstimulation. So how about, this is hyperstimulation, how about cerebral palsy? But if a patient came to have the treatment, any patient with even multiple pregnancies, forget about, um, uh, or, or prematurity, or second trimester miscarriage, you will not be, and of course, medical disorder, you will not get away with giving her more than one embryo at a time, no matter what. If you give her one embryo at a time, that's it. You have done everything possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about using a cabergoline in uh, primary prevention of ovarian hyperstimulation? Another question from one of the uh, attendees. I am not sure it is primary because you are not really, you are, you are creating your own definition of primary. Primary prevention of hyperstimulation is agonist trigger and antagonist suppression. If you didn't do this, you have not done primary. But cabergoline is done as secondary to prevent early hyperstimulation. Uh, another question uh, asking about the growth hormone rule and the best strategy if applicable. Uh, I don't think really the evidence is very convincing. It's expensive. There is no safety data and the efficacy is not particularly great. And uh, I don't expect you to believe me, but I have settled for the last 10, 15 years, genuine poor responders who have fewer follicles and whose anti antimalarian hormone is under five pico, uh, pico mole per liter or 0.7 nanomole per mil or whatever. I don't know the, the other units that you use here. Uh, they will always be poor responder. If you give them even TNT, not just um, uh, uh, the gross hormone. So please, the same applies to the DHA. The same applies to testosterone. Nothing will create follicles and eggs other than what is in the ovaries. Perfect. A uh, question, I think it's, uh, it needs a whole lecture. What do you do in recurrent implantation failure? We had a big lecture about recurrent implant. Where were you? You, you obviously missed it. Yeah. What I do in recurrent implantation failure, I assist patient individually. Number one, I have to be clear about my definition of recurrent implantation failure. Because if I have a patient, I keep coming hard on poor older women. If I have a patient who's 42 years of age and she had three cycles and she didn't have luck, I should not kill myself. I can kill myself with sympathy with this patient, but I, there are no surprises there. Biology tells me the chance of this patient after three cycles leaving the clinic with a baby will be 20, 25%. So she has 75% chance of having the scenario I am seeing her for. So I reassess the, the, the information. If there is polyps that I did not take care of, I will remove it. If there is hydrosalpings I overlooked, I will remove it. If there is fibroids that's impinging the cavity, I'll do something about it. If she has adenomyosis, then we talk about what we can do. But if this is not the case, I will just ask her to keep the resilience and keep trying until she has that embryo that give her a baby. There are some people who might recommend doing PGS. PGS or PGTA will not create embryos, will just exclude them. Sometimes exclude them rightly, sometimes exclude them wrongly. So I'd rather replace her embryos into the uterus in subsequent cycle rather than subject them to the hit and miss. I may be harsh on PGTA, but everybody knows that. Okay. <laughs> yes, we know. Uh, uh, Dr. Mohammed Samir asking about uh, urinary versus uh, uh, a recombinant FSH in women with the polycystic ovary syndrome. There is nothing really to separate the two. There is honestly, that's right. just, um, if you think about it logically, I know, I know there are some school of thought that thinks HMG will be resulting in lower follicular recruitment. It will not be in a meaningful way because nobody used, really in any scientific forum, use HMG as a prevention of ovarian hyperstimulation in PCOS patients. You will not see that in any decent literature. So, and also, the patient with PCOS, they have high LH. So what do they need the additional LH in the HMG for? But if you have HMG that you are using it anyway, it's fine. But don't 
get the patient the impression you are using something specific that will stop because it will give you false sense of security and the results can be disappointing. Um, um, sorry, um, uh, there is a lot of questions, so I have to choose between these uh, very nice questions. What about uh, a hint about progesterone support mm -hmm. for routine IVF tracts? Yes, progesterone support we can't do without. It is the main stay for luteal phase support is progesterone. In, in, um, there, there are different preparations. Vaginal preparation are as good as intramuscular preparation. And nowadays, mm -hmm. some people also using oral preparation. Mm -hmm. They seem to be comparable in efficacy, even though we don't have the same level of track record of um, safety with the oral for luteal phase support. We use it from the day of egg collection. We get the eggs out, the patient recover, we give her the medication and say, from tonight, start your lethal phase support. We use either 800 milligram of cyclogest or 90 milligram of um, crenone gel. And the patient will continue on this until she does the pregnancy test. If the pregnancy test is positive, it is customary to continue with it until the patient come for her pregnancy scan and then stop. If it is a frozen cycle, of course, she will have to continue with it until she is 12 weeks pregnant when the placenta is in full force. Sorry. That's as simple as that. Uh, important question in the, in the corona pandemic. What, what protocol do you recommend? Uh, the corona does not have any impact on the protocol except that we are really trying to avoid hyperstimulation as best as we could. So like almost moved everybody to the antagonist, antagonist trigger and um, freezing because it gives us a little bit more leeway to give higher dose to get more eggs for the patient. Because to get hyperstimulation in the corona and try to find an intensive care bed. I, I can't remember the last time we had a patient who had to go to intensive care anyway, but just at least theoretically, you will not be forgiven by the general hospital if you add it to the burden of dealing with corona by giving them a patient who's hyperstimulated. So most of the patients are advised. Plus, at the initial phase, we were not aware, we were not sure whether pregnancy during this time is hazardous as the baby could be, the pregnancy could be affected. So the advice was to treat them but not to intend a pregnancy, but to intend embryos to be frozen for future use. Uh, a question from uh, Dr. Muhammad Ahmed. In your opinion, what will add value for Boris Bundar? Nothing, nothing. It's just to be <laughs> rational. Giving them two tons of gonadotrophins will not make them grow eggs. Give them a dose of 300, 375 to make yourself happy. But if you ask me, even two to five would be just as good. The Dutch did the study between 150 and 450, and the outcome was similar. Because I always tell the patient, if you have a pot that has three seeds, if you put two kilograms of fertilizer, you will only get the three seeds. Yeah. Mm. So for women with the polycystic ovary syndrome with high AMH more than five, yeah. uh, what do you recommend as a starting dose? This is a gut scent because you will tell this patient, Let's agree from the outset. Your plan will be, we will use a short antagonist regime. We will give you the agonist trigger and we will freeze all. And if the patient, you didn't give me age. If the patient was normally say 28, normally I give her 150. And that should be enough for this patient. But if the patient's 37, I will give her two to five. Or even I start for the first three days with 300 and then reduce it later. Because if the patient produce 25 eggs, I'm happy. I, the more I get, as long as it is not at the expense of getting her over and hyperstimulation. And I know if I use agnus trigger, hyperstimulation will be a virtuality rather than an eventual uh, 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 a possibility. Yeah. So I took the chance also to ask my own question. Yeah, if you are uh, giving the patient- That's the privilege of being a chair. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, for giving a generous agonist trigger, do you measure the LH after 12 hours to be sure that the LH is coming up? It is, it is prudent to do that. But because if you run a program of 3,000 patients, to do it for everyone, it will be exaggeration because the majority do not fall into this category anyway. The, you have to have a target group. 
we have the largest PGD program in the UK. And for PGD, most of the patients will have been on the oral contraceptive pill for three, four years to avoid pregnancy yeah. with a handicapped child. This is a high risk group because having the pill will suppress their hypothalamic ovarian access, access. and they, you must measure their LH. And okay. if it is less than 15, the day after the trigger, you have to buy the bullet and give them small door of HCG and consider secondary prevention, okay? Any patient who has hypothalamic element to her profile, like very thin or slim, exercise repeatedly, her BMI is on the lean side, you have doubt about this. You notice in her hormonal profile that her FSH and LH is 2.5 or 3. Then you need to be careful and do it. But for other cases, you don't need to measure LH really. Okay. And the, the cutoff uh, at which you are giving HCG? 15. 15. 15. Less than 15, you give HCG. Yeah. Uh, another question from uh, Dr. Muhammad Abdurrahman. When you measure the progesterone, and what do you think? It, is it beneficial to measure the progesterone the IVF cycle? Oh, for the late follicular progesterone. This is one of the issues that, again, we disagree with the whole world. But we have good reason to do that. One, because progesterone is so labile. If you measure it at 8 o'clock and measure it at 10 o'clock and measure it 12 o'clock, and you can get figures that's like you, you from normal to abnormal. That's one. The second one, there is almost a consensus now for the high responder, it is to be expected because it's coming from the granulosa cells from all these follicles that resulted in the egg. So it's irrelevant. From the normal responder, probably you can, you know, it's splitting hair and it's not very common. From the poor responder, freezing does not do them any good. So how can you go and rectify this? So we ended up, practically speaking, we don't measure it because the maximum probably will be three or four percent. You can't bring everybody with that cohort for two or three percent. The intervention based on your measurement, not certain whether it will improve the outcome or not. Because I'm not aware, you may be, Mohammed, you're a good reader. Are you aware of any randomized control trial that mm -hmm. randomized patient to freeze or fresh in the face of high progesterone? None. But we are working with association. Association does not mean causation. Right. Uh, in women with polycystic cover syndrome with high LH levels and irregular menses, yeah. uh, do you recommend anything different than the usual protocol? The, the usual protocol, high LH or not. For, for some patients with high AMH, some, some patients will have AMH L of certain. High, high, high LH. AMH. And also yeah. high LH. We okay. find it helpful really to start them with high dose because if you start them with the standard dose of 150, it does not touch them. Yes, so you start the most high dose to get the recruitment going and then you can reduce it. Um, I think uh, Dr. Mitt had asked about the uh, hysteroscopy recurrent implantation failure. I think Again, uh, recurrent or not recurrent. Yeah. If you have the endometrium clear to your eye, eight, nine millimeter triple line, there is absolutely nothing to see. That the, uh, I always say that hysteroscopy is just a camera. It's not a crystal ball that you will see the lack of the patient through. Okay, so forget about this um, bit of promotion. There are some people right. who just, because they are good at it, they promote it at all costs. It doesn't make sense. Dr. Atiyaf uh, asking about the, uh, one of the ads on in the uh, IVF program, the heparin, low molecular weight heparin. Do you recommend them, any indication? Heparin makes people bleed, not get <laughs> pregnant. Right. We don't have 8 billion people on the face of the earth without mo their mother ever touch heparin except for thromboembolic issues. And then we go and improvise and we add it to nature. It doesn't make sense. 60% of those patients are having IVF for male factor. Why someone who's having male factor issue needs heparin? But we just, common sense is rare, not just not so common. Dr. Uh, Hassan asking about the uh, any uh, uh, other drugs rather than the progesterone, the luteal support. Uh, Do you other? What used to happen is HCG, but I would stay away from HCG because the risk of hyperstimulation. But HCG is a strong supporter. It's a strong, strong luteal phase support. But you are really putting yourself wide for criticism and for disaster if you started using HCG for luteal phase support. So it's only progesterone plus. Let me just ask the, 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 the person who asked the question. Why do you want to have this agreement with nature? 
Isn't that what happened in nature? In the second Sorry. half of the cycle, there is progesterone. Why are you asking for something else? There is either progesterone from the corpus luteum, topped up okay. by HCG from the pregnancy, or there is progesterone from externally to emulate what happened in nature. What other agent do you have in mind? Okay? So okay. The, 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 we are trying to do what nature does. Yeah. Perfect. Dr. Abatul also asking a repeated question about the uh, uh, repeated GV oocytes or immature oocytes for two or three trials of XC. The same applies. Yeah. When you are right. met with this um, uh, dilemma, unfortunately, uh, uh, you can try, you can improvise, but you end up with people in the West. It is nothing is easy, but relatively easy. They have to go on and to have uh, donor eggs and pregnant with the first cycle because there's nothing you can do. There is some metabolic block. Some of this, there are some very rare genetic, or there is a rare gene that has been um, associated, but it's not in every case. And so far, we don't have a solution. Even in vitro maturation may not tackle this. Dr. Sarita from uh, Nairobi uh, asked about the intratrine HCG at ovum pickup or uh, before embryo transfer. Again, if you take physiology and to take mother nature as a control, is it normal for any pregnancy to find HCG in the uterus at the time of egg collection? Of course not. Why are we improvising? HCG is a result, not a cause. HCG result from the growing implanting embryo, from the trophoblast, from the sensitive trophoblast. So yes. why are we improvising? All the evidence point out to it is a waste of time. Intrauterine infusion of HCG does not help. Intrauterine infusion of heparin does not help. Intrauterine infusion of granulocyte colonoscopy stimulating factor is not help. So it is, yeah. A question about the monitoring of IVF cycle regarding yes. hormonal and transvaginal. It's not really hormonal doesn't help because uh, I don't know what figure do you have in mind that you go for hormonal because that was popular maybe 25 years ago where people suggested that per follicle or you, you need to get something between 70 and 210 picogram per mil. That's just gone those days. You measure by folliculogram for the patient. If you have high risk, you don't need to measure because you have the GnRH agonist trigger to rely on. Plus, if you were to choose between estradiol measurement and the number of follicles, the number of follicles is much more reliable. So if you count more than 19 follicles, or 18, um, nine, 18 and more, I think, uh, above 11 millimeter, then your patient at risk of hyperstimulation, prepare yourself either for agonist trigger, for freeze all, or at least the patient need to know, or cancel if you don't have good freezing. Yeah. So we still have the time for more questions because I have a lot of more than 40 or 50 questions. We still have time. But we, we must also not get David bored. I can get question after David finishes his talk because uh, I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Well, yeah. Dr. Said, do, do you recommend to stop questions here and give uh, Dr. David the chance to begin his lecture?
ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and great honor to be introducing Professor David Gardner. Those of you who haven't heard David Gardner's name in connection with IVF and embryology of IVF and the cutting edge science of IVF, you have been asleep. You did <laughs> not really have that intimate connection with IVF. If you didn't do that, you will have read his book, which also very famous and cited. And um, David's name is synonymous to blastocyst in some way, not just because of his pioneering grading that we all use until now, but um, also with his interest in, um, in uh, embryo culture. And as he put it in a very um, interesting way, don't stress it. So we will yeah. hear all about how not to stress the embryos in the embryo culture and how we can improve the process overall. Uh, David, the whole audience is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. And my thanks to Dr. Fazi for the uh, invitation to, to be with you this evening. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well during these difficult times. Thank you. So embryo culture, it means a lot to different people. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the things that are, that are happening now and that are going to happen in the future. But I also gave a lot of thought to this and I think it's really worth thinking about what does it take to grow a good embryo in your laboratories? Um, and the, the term don't stress it is very important. So uh, here are my disclosures. I received research funding from Vitra Life and I'm the advisor to Fertilitis and Viboplex. So we're here we have the first week of life, the exquisite development of our fertilized eggs and to the blastocyst. And during this period of development, the embryo, as you know, undergoes dramatic changes as it progresses through the oviduct into the uterus. And indeed, the oviduct and uterus provide very different environments for the embryo to develop. Now, the other thing, of course, is to know this is a cross section of the human fallopian tube. And you can see the close proximity in which the embryo is to the maternal cells. So there's a communication all the time. And there's continual movement, exchange of metabolites, etc. Now, if you think about what we do in the laboratory, we do this. Until recently, this was pretty much what we had. We had our benchtop incubators, uh, the boxes, and we grew embryos, or still do, in droplets under oil in a polystyrene dish. And along came time-lapse machines, which have been um, a huge advantage technologically in our ability to understand how embryos develop. And here we have our culture dish. So it's very similar, it's a polystyrene dish, but at least now we're growing embryos in little tiny wells. So at least they can create a microenvironment. But I think we'd all agree that this does not equate to the complexities of the female tract. As a result of which, we create stress. No matter how good we think we are in the laboratory, we still create stress. And sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. And that's what I would like to focus on for the first 10 minutes. So how do you know if your embryos are stressed? Well, it's quite, quite straightforward initially because they grow slower. And we used to suffer 20 odd years ago from uh, fragmentation. In fact, there was a whole literature based on how to characterize how an embryo fragmented. Actually, that's just an artifact of stress. Um, we get fewer blastocysts, and if we do get blastocysts, they tend to have poor inner cell masses. And you can see those. So that's one thing you can see. However, a lot of things happen to the embryo that you can't see. Uh, metabolism is the first thing that gets compromised. You see gene expression and altered imprinting, and all of this results in reduced viability, and that means fewer babies. <clears throat> so there's a lot that can happen. So what are the sources of the stress then? So I'm going to give you a list. It's not exhaustive, um, but it's the ones that we have documented well in the literature, my lab, and many others over the last four decades. So serum. Serum was one of the first things we used to add to embryo culture media. Turns out it's one of the worst things we could add to embryo culture media. We no longer add serum. Now, <clears throat> a poor medium composition. What I mean by this, it's got inappropriate nutrients and typically lacks amino acids because amino acids are amongst the most important regulators of an embryo. Now, ammonium is a paradox because when we grow embryos in a plastic dish, in a static environment, ammonium can accumulate through the uh, breakdown of amino acids and through the metabolism of amino acids. So, and this is particularly nasty and toxic to embryos. Oxygen, probably the biggest problem we face in culture of any cell type, whether it's a sperm, egg, embryo, stem cell, 
is atmospheric oxygen. Um, in the environment, it's around 20%, depending on where you are. Uh, that's at sea level. If you're above sea level, it's obviously less. Um, and it's extremely toxic at 20%. And if you think about the tissues in our body that see 20% oxygen, apart from our skin, our eyes, and the lining of our lungs, at the vascular capillary bed, the blood supply is around 5% oxygen to most tissues. So 20% is extremely toxic, and I'm going to come back to that. Another stress we've referred to as premature replacement in the uterus. In other words, putting a cleavage stage embryo back too early is a stress because the environments are different. And that's well, well documented in every animal model published to date, as well as the human. For those who work in the laboratory, just by simply pipetting your embryos too quickly sounds, sounds something so innocuous, but it can cause stress activating factors. Temperature and pH. Uh, they are so mundane, and yet you cannot possibly overlook the significance of that, and I'm going to come back to that. So <clears throat> for those of you who are interested, this is a, a review I wrote with one of my graduate students at the time a couple of years ago, and it's in the Journal of Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. It's a really comprehensive view, and it will take you through all of this first part of the lecture in great detail. So I know it's rather late where you all are, so if you're feeling a bit sleepy, go to that review later on. Okay, so one of the things that we realized very early on is that if you're going to be a really, really good clinic and have very high pregnancy rates, you need to take a step back and think, well, you know, it's, it's not just about the media in a job. It, it's, a lot it's a lot more. And, and it was that epiphany that really helped us in Colorado um, make great leaps and bounds in embryo culture. And this is due to the multitude of factors that can impact the success rate. And certainly in an IVF laboratory, there are so many parameters to optimize, but here's the catch. They interact. And if you have one thing that's bad, it predisposes the embryo to greater stress later on. And this is another review with another graduate student um, in Human Reproduction Update, and where we document a lot of this concept of how the stresses can impact on your embryos. So I'm gonna give you a working framework that we use for the last 30 years that's really helped us get through. So we start off with our culture media and you can buy them now. Back in the day, we used to have to make them uh, in our laboratories back. I remember that in the, in the 80s and 90s, making media for, for our patients. But now you can buy whichever one you want from several suppliers. But it's not just about the media. What you have to consider is the culture system. What type of tissue culture where your oil, the number of embryos per drop and your gas phase, okay? And this is particularly important because this, the oxygen as I alluded to, is a source of stress. The CO2 is critical for your pH and they all interact. And <clears throat> this is a paper we published just last year, um, another graduate student, Rebecca. And what it brought to our attention was that culture and gas and in particular oxygen the volumes you use and the gas you use have this really profound interaction. So again, just a great example of the complexities of what we do. Then your culture system sits in your laboratory. Your laboratory, how many embryologists do you have? How well trained are they? What type of incubator do you have? And do you have enough? And do you have sufficient air quality purification systems? And that's particularly difficult when you have a lab that's in a very busy city. So this is the structure. Now it's important that on top of that, you have quality control, quality assurance to make sure that everything's working correctly. And as I alluded to temperature and pH, you cannot overlook, you have to use the appropriate technology and make sure that's calibrated to make sure all of this works like a smooth, well-run engine. All right, I can't overstate it. And here's a nice review, um, pretty much a who's who of modern embryologists published in Fertility Sterility talking about a lot of these technologies that we need to optimize and temperature and pH is considered. So finally, we get round to the patient and obviously the patient, um, as we just heard, it takes the oversight, right? You can't, you can't create oversights and really all we can do as IVF practitioners is you can affect this if you, if you change the stimulation, but basically this is a, a predetermined by the patient. And that is affected, just as we heard, by the age, the etiology, her genetics, and her diet. So all of these things have a profound impact on the patient before we even see them at the clinic. 
And then we have the stimulation. The stimulation can impact on oversight quality, but it will interact with these various things. And as we just heard, age is one of the biggest drivers. We also know that stimulation can impact endometrial receptivity. And then we can talk about what kind of luteal support, but bearing in mind that this is related to this. And then we have the outcome. And I think it's when you take the step back and work together as a team. And I've always said IVF is the biggest team sport I've ever played. You know, you need to have great communication between the laboratory and the physicians. If you don't have that, it's not gonna work. You get that dialogue going, you've got a real chance of having excellent success rates. Okay. <clears throat> and I put that together in another way of looking at it. It's just to show you how all of these things influence embryo phenotype. You've got your laboratory, your culture, manipulations over here, the patient, quality, even embryo sex, and they can affect the phenotype. Now, one of the things to, it's a really important to acknowledge, and again, that predetermines the success of your IVF laboratory is the following. The younger the embryo is, all the way back to the egg, the greater its susceptibility to stress. So here we have our stress on this side. And as the embryo develops, its resistance to stress increases. And this is because at this stage, the embryo really lacks the ability to regulate pH, for one thing. It hasn't got the uh, transporters activated for many hours. Before compaction, again, the embryo is really susceptible to changes in its environment because it can't regulate its intracellular environment. Once it's got an epithelium down here, it can really tolerate a greater variety of stresses because it can control its internal environment. And by the time you've got the blastocyst, the blastocyst is a very tough entity. So <clears throat> we often hear about, oh, there's problems growing embryos to blastocyst. It's not the blastocyst that's the problem. It's the first three days here that causes you the issues. And in all the clinics I've worked in, we use embryo isolates, embryo cribs. And that means we can create an environment within our laboratory to protect the embryo from pH and temperature shifts, which is very, very important. All right, so that's getting to where we, uh, where we want to be with, with regards to the laboratory. But what about the future of culture media? Um, I've been around quite a long time. Uh, this 37 years, I just worked out, 37 years I've been doing this. And um, I hear nowadays people say, oh, there's nothing new in culture, it's, it's all done. Uh, I smile. Um, as I say to my graduates every year, you know, you're the luckiest students I've ever had because this, this year is the most exciting year to be in embryology and IVF. And they say, oh, you must say that every year. And I say, yeah, I do, because every year it is more exciting to do what we do. With regards to culture media, there is actually a lot happening in this space, and I'm delighted to share with you some of our data and some of our ideas for the future. So this is currently the status of most culture media, um, balanced salt solutions, hopefully amino acids, some vitamins, carbohydrates, a protein source in the form of albumin. And a lot of media now have this uh, glycosaminoglycan hyaluronin, uh, which is present throughout the reproductive uh, cycle in the female tract. Okay, but that really doesn't equate to what we've got over here in the female tract, where we've also got proteoglycans, mucins, hormones, et cetera, et cetera, growth factors and cytokines. So we're missing an awful lot. <clears throat> now, um, I know Dr. Forsey and our group and several others have been working on this area, so but I'm not gonna cover that today. What I'm gonna talk about is actually antioxidants. And the reason for this, I think will become obvious as I review the toxicity of oxygen again, Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, with regards to culture, in vivo, <clears throat> the embryo is exposed to very low levels of oxygen, typically around 5%. So data to date on every animal studied has shown that when you grow embryos at 5% oxygen, you get improved embryo development and pregnancies. In fact, it's very difficult to grow sheep, cattle, outbred mice strains at 20% oxygen. They just won't grow. And now we know that, and it's been demonstrated that 5% oxygen improves blastocyst development and quality in the human, and there's growing data on that. So why is that the case? Well, it turns out 20% oxygen can have a profound negative effect on pretty much every aspect of a cell's response. In this case, we've got gene expression, the epigenome, it can alter methylation and acetylation, the proteome, metabolism, 
homeostasis, and then we see slower cleavage rates, blastocyst development, and lower pregnancy rates. But with regards to focus on the development of a healthy child, then getting away from 20% oxygen is very, very important. Now, <clears throat> the other thing we've learned is that 20% oxygen increases the susceptibility of an embryo to a second stress. <clears throat> and this is work from yet another graduate student, Petra, where she took uh, oxygen and compared five and 20% and looked at the metabolism of mouse embryos. And what she found was initially that oxygen, 20% oxygen completely changed the metabolic pattern of an embryo um, in a very negative way. And that it also changed the ability of mouse embryos to regulate against ammonium toxicity. So we know ammonium predisposes an embryo to actually a, a lot of stress, but together with 20% oxygen, it's, it's a really bad situation. And here I show some data from her work that <clears throat> this is 5% in yellow and 20% in blue. And you can see that for most all the amino acids, the patterns have changed. In fact, it's really smashed their metabolic function. And the same was true for glucose. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> glucose is a biomarker of viability. So the higher the glucose uptakes, the, the happier the embryo. And here you see the 20% oxygen has completely uh, lowered glucose uptake by mass blastocyst, which is a very bad idea. <clears throat> All right, so we could grow embryos <clears throat> in lower oxygen, but unfortunately we still have lots of problems. Uh, we expose embryos and gametes all the time to 20% oxygen in the lab. When we do an oocyte collection, when we do a sperm prep, when we do ICSI, a fertilization check, when we do an embryo grading, if you don't use time-lapse or biopsy. And sadly, still, several labs still use 20% oxygen for culture. So it's still very topical. And even if you use 5% oxygen, you're still going to have oxidative stress, as I'm going to talk about. And you also get reactive oxygen species formed during sperm prep and cryopreservation. So you can't get away from uh, oxidative stress. So what's the big deal? What does it do? So ROS, reactive oxygen species. Well, the documented literature will show poor embryo quality, higher levels of intracellular peroxide, not very good, linked to apoptosis, induces membrane damage, DNA damage, delay, reproductive ability, the list goes on. So high levels of reactive oxygen species are very detrimental to both gametes and embryos. Okay, so here we have oxidative stress, creating reactive oxygen. But as I said, even if you grow at 5% oxygen, we still have what we call endogenous reactive oxygen. And, oops, and that comes from a mitochondria in the sperm and embryos because through oxidative phosphorylation, we actually create reactive oxygen species. <clears throat> we also have exogenous reactive oxygen from oxygen, the media, cryopreservation, IVF, leading to all of the things I just pointed out. And there's the reduced viability. So it's, it's really a cascade of damage. But what can antioxidants do to help mitigate some of this? So historically, antioxidants have been added to culture media, but typically they've been added individually. And if you look down here, you can see the first paper was 1991, some 30 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and, and we've published on individual ones as well. But the concept, just like growth factors and cytokines, you shouldn't consider them individually. They need to work in functional groups. So our question was, what happens if you look at functional groups of antioxidants? And this is data from the first paper we published on the mouse model looking at pronucleate embryo culture. So we chose three antioxidants. We would, we'd worked on several over the years, and we, we focused on alpha-lipoic acid, acetylcarnitine, and N-acetylcysteine. Uh, alpha-lipoic acid is known as the antioxidant of all antioxidants and can recharge other antioxidants. Acetylcarnitine, because it's uh, very high levels in seminal plasma, and it's known to improve chromosomal structure, and cysteine because it's the precursor to glutathione and is also a good antioxidant in its own right. So we looked at those individually and found they were very beneficial. But our question was, oops, what happens when you move them together? 
Okay, so in this case, we were doing culture. So we took pronucleate embryos and we cultured them. And what we found was, and bearing in mind that embryos tend to grow well in groups, but more and more we, we are moving to individual culture through time-lapse and through PGT. So we did this experiment where we grew embryos in groups of 10 or individually. And what you can see is that, and this is at 20% oxygen, put that over there. And what you can see now is that we get a significant effect of 20% oxygen on cell number. This is the inner cell mass, this is the trophectoderm. But when we do this in individual culture, we got a much bigger effect, 15% increase, a 34% increase. So what we concluded from this was that triple antioxidants have a greater effect than individuals, but the triple antioxidants are greater in individual culture in 20% oxygen. Introduce two stresses, single culture, 20% oxygen. What happens now if we repeat that with 5% oxygen? Well, interestingly, the antioxidants, whether in group or individual, have a significant effect on embryo cell number at 5% oxygen, so that's physiological. So this shows that there is reactive oxygen generated even at 5%. But what you can see here was that the level of increase was the same, whether they were group or individual. In other words, that stress that the 20% oxygen had impacted on the individual cultures had been negated by growing embryos at 5%, which is really good news. So if you're using time-lapse and at 5%, that's a good condition. We then wanted to do embryo transfers. So this is our control group, and these are embryos that have been grown in the combination of our three antioxidants at 20% oxygen. And what you can see is that we got an increase in fetal weights, placental weights, crown rump, and a trend, it's a 10% increase, but it wasn't higher in implantation rate, but fetal weights, placental weights were higher in the mouse. Now, I know people are worried about fetal weights and birth weights in the human. I can assure you that these weights are still below an in vivo control mouse. So although we have an increase in the mouse model, that's actually a very good thing. We then went on to look at IVF and were the antioxidants of benefits to the gametes during collection and fertilization. So we set up a nice little matrix here whereby we had IVF media uh, for here, and the control, no antioxidants or with antioxidants. And then we had culture media without or with antioxidants. And then we could determine how well the embryos grew in this matrix. And what we found was IVF on its own, which is over here, actually had a beneficial effect, even if antioxidants were not present in the culture medium. And if they were present in the IVF medium, they were still beneficial in the culture. But what you can see is that the best effect is when you have it present at both. So moving forward, we would recommend antioxidants in both the IVF media to protect the sperm, to protect the egg, and in the culture medium to protect the embryo throughout growth. Okay, so I alluded to the fact that what about other procedures, ICSI, biopsy? And when we expose our embryos, even transiently, five to 20 minutes to atmospheric oxygen, does it matter? So we did a little experiment where we took embryos, um, put them in handling and washing medium, and just exposed them on the bench to atmospheric oxygen for five to 20 minutes, and then measured intracellular reactive oxygen and looked how the embryos developed. And this was the interesting bit. We grew the embryos at 5% oxygen. Okay, so what this represents is just a transient stress, a transient oxidative stress. Does it matter? Can the embryo get better? And what we found was during this period, the levels of, in this case, hydrogen peroxide was significantly decreased if we had antioxidants present and the resulting blastocysts have more cells. So what this shows you is that yes, even a five to 10 minute exposure to atmospheric oxygen has a downstream effect. And here we provide direct data to show that yes, that little period results in an increase in intracellular peroxide or reactive oxygen. All right, I alluded to the fact that freezing uh, or vitrification can actually induce reactive oxygen species. 
So what we wanted to do was a series of experiments, can these same antioxidants present in the cryopreservation solutions have an impact on the embryo? Can we improve, in this case, vitrification? And it's significant because we're doing more and more cryopreservation. And you know this is because uh, people are preferring to do um, frozen embryo transfers over fresh, and that's certainly true in Japan, where pretty much all of the cycles are FETs. PGT is growing rapidly, and um, oocyte donation, oncofertility are becoming more and more available. So this is something we have to get right, and we have to optimize. So cryo-induced trauma to embryos is manifest downstream. What can we do about it? Cryopreservation, if you think about it, is, is a really traumatic event for a, a cell to go through. Um, you've got high levels of cryoprotectants, increased osmolalities, extreme temperature changes. That leads to oxidative stress in itself. That generates ROS and that can induce part of the cryo damage. DNA damage, delayed development, cell membrane damage, disruption to homeostasis, increase in peroxide, decrease in, the list goes on. And all of these have been shown. And this is a particularly scary one because this is an epigenetic mark, methylation acetylation. This is the epigenetic change in the chromatin structure. Cryo can do these things. And then you get altered gene expression. So all of this has been published elsewhere. So you can find all of these data or go to that paper and you'll see the references. Interestingly, when a cell's damaged, obviously it activates its repair mechanisms. Ironically, they require a lot of energy, which in turn create more reactive oxygen. So you've got this spiral of oxidative damage going on. The simple question was, will antioxidants help? So we designed a very nice little matrix again, putting uh, growing our embryos to day four and then growing them and then adding the cryoprotectants to the vitrification or warming solutions and seeing which one mattered and then growing the embryos out or transferring them. And what you can see here, this is our control, vitrification and warming. There were no antioxidants present in the vitrification or warming solutions. But when we added the antioxidants to the vitrification, you can see we got a significant increase in resultant cell number. If we added the antioxidants to the warming solutions, we didn't see an effect. So there was no benefit so our best group is really in the, in the cryopreservation solutions for vitrification. Does it really matter? Well, we looked at cell numbers the day after, we saw an increase, but we always like to do embryo transfers, which we did. But on the way to that, we looked at some epigenetic marks. And what we found as consistent with the published literature is this is our non-vitrified control and this is our vitrified group. This is a significant, highly significant drop in the levels of acetylation of H3K27 and H3K9, which is remarkable to think about. We're changing the epigenetic mark simply by cryopreserving the cell. And what we found was when we added our antioxidants, we got somewhat of an alleviation of that loss, but we didn't eliminate that loss. So clearly that's still an issue, but it's really uh, reassuring. What we then went on to do um, is embryo transfers again. So we grew our embryos, in this case, at 20% oxygen and vitrified them. And again, we saw an increase in fetal weights, crown rump length, limb morphology, and overall fetal age. So simply by adding the vitrification solutions and antioxidants together, we see an increase in the viability post-transfer of the mouse. We did this again for embryos that have been cultured at 5% oxygen. And lo and behold, we see a benefit again. Um, we didn't see a benefit in fetal weights, but you can see there was a trend from 184 to 196. So that was uh, encouraging. So what can we conclude about antioxidants in a mouse model? So individually, these three antioxidants have a very profound positive effect on mouse embryo development. Uh, they improve as a group either at five or 20% oxygen because reactive oxygen species is still generated at 5% uh, oxygen, but it's bigger at 20%. So 20% oxygen is still the bigger oxidative stress. We found that antioxidants are greatest and biggest benefit when you have them both in the IVF and the culture medium. 
that if you have antioxidants in the handling medium, say for example, we use GMOPs, you put it in the GMOPs, during the handling process, you will improve uh, the capacity of those embryos to protect themselves against peroxide, for example. And as a result, fetal development is increased in the presence of antioxidants, irrespective of the oxygen concentration you've used to grow the embryos. And really excitingly, the antioxidants protect embryos during cryopreservation. So <clears throat> we seem to have discovered a whole new niche in embryo culture now, where antioxidants protect IVF, embryo culture, embryo manipulation, and then at cryopreservation. So that's mouse data. What about some clinical studies? So concomitantly with all of the mouse work, we were busy doing some pilot clinical studies. And the work I'm just gonna briefly allude to was work that we did in collaboration with uh, Kuramoto and uh, Yoshida in Tokyo. And whereby we did a prospective randomized trial looking at sibling oocyte splits. So the oocytes were split from each patient and treated with antioxidants. Unfortunately, the sperm were not treated in this case. We grew the embryos out to the blastocyst stage and we transferred them following vitrification. And the really interesting data came here, looking at the clinical outcomes. Uh, we used the G media and these are patients under 35 and these are the patients 35 to 40. Implantation rates uh, for the younger patient group were very good, 50%. Ongoing pregnancy rate for retrieval, 50%. And then when we saw the patients here um, over 30, we see this characteristic drop, expected drop in pregnancy rates associated with maternal age. When we did this with the antioxidants, you can see similar data to the controls, but look at this, we didn't see the drop in implantation or ongoing pregnancy rate as the patients got older, which is really interesting. So it's well documented as as we age, we accumulate oxidative damage and the older we get, the more damage we accrue. Uh, and that leads you to being susceptible to other stresses. So there's, a, there's an interesting literature we discovered uh, on the effects of aging in Drosophila and how actually using genetic tricks to upregulate the expression of uh, various antioxidant genes, you can actually alleviate the age-related effects um, in Drosophila's eggs. Could it be that adding exogenous antioxidants to the human could benefit uh, those patients uh, of advanced maternal age? This pilot study is very exciting. We're currently halfway through a prospective randomized trial at Melbourne IVF that's powered uh, for outcome, we, we, we are recruiting um, 1,200 plus patients for that trial halfway through. Um, and um, I look forward to updating you in due course on how all that's going. So concluding thoughts, um, really in order to maintain your laboratory, you have to take a step back, look at that holistic concept of how to grow embryos. I provided you some references there as well, um, but it's much more than the culture medium you buy. And it's essential that you invest into a comprehensive quality control assurance management system. That way you can really get on top, not only of your laboratory, but working with your physicians uh, transfer outcomes as well. In a mouse model, we found that antioxidants improve IVF, culture, embryo transfer and vitrification. So pretty much everything we did, it had a beneficial effect. And in our clinical data, it would transpire that they seem to have a beneficial effect, um, particularly of advanced maternal age. So they may have a role to play in a demographic that really are susceptible to stress in our laboratories. And I think it's important to state this, embryo culture has not been optimized. We're continuously working to improve it. Um, and that's the really exciting point. And I, and I think, you know, as I said, I've been doing this 37 years and to, you know, come up with this antioxidant story uh, 35 years after we start just shows there's always more to do, which is really exciting. So I thought I'd leave you um, with some of the things that we're currently working on and that maybe if I'm lucky enough, you'll invite me back in a year or so's time and I can tell you what else we're doing. Um, biomarkers of embryo health and aneuploidy. This is a really exciting topic. It's actually where I started my journey 
in the UK 37 years ago, my PhD was actually on biomarkers of embryo health. Um, we have a really lovely study coming out in human reproduction in the next few months on this topic, so I won't say any more. Something that's really exciting is uh, this field called metaboloepigenetics. This is the regulation of the epigenome by metabolism. It's a relatively recent discovered phenomenon. Um, and we published a few reviews and some really key papers on stem cells in this area. Um, watch this space, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, blastocyst endometrial signaling. Um, again, there's a lot happening in that space and we've been very fortunate uh, to be doing some very nice work in that area for the last few years. And again, our papers on all of these subjects will be coming out in the next uh, six to 12 months. Growth factors and cytokines and nanofabrication and microperfusion. Um, this has also been an obsession of mine for a long, long time. Um, I published some 25 years ago what I thought the future of IVF would be to involve microfluidics, growing embryos in small chambers, perfusing them, how do we do that? Um, there's so much happening in what we call nanofabrication or 3D printing, microperfusion, whether that is in um, microfluidic devices or other devices, a lot is happening in that space and it's really exciting. So look, look forward to all of those things too. And of course, next generation culture media. We are very busy working on those in the background as well. So it's all very exciting. Um, I'd like to thank all, my, all the people in my labs, my, my university lab, my who worked on uh, a lot of the antioxidant stuff, my PhD students, the embryology team at Melbourne IVF and many collaborators, too, too many to acknowledge all of them who've been a delight to work with over many, many years. Now, I couldn't give you a lecture on embryo culture without talking about um, a very special person in my life, which was Michelle Lane. Sadly, Michelle passed away in February. Um, she was only 49 years old. Mitch was my first graduate student. She was a postdoc, she was a great colleague, and we worked together and published over 80 articles together over the years, and she will be dearly missed by, by all of us. I threw a lot at you in the last um, few minutes. Um, so I wanted to leave you with some references, if you're interested. You'll see that Mitch is present even last year was our last publication in Peter Nagy's book on culture media. Um, but if you really want to know more about the composition of culture media, uh, how each of the components, whether it's pyruvate, lactate, which amino acid, how do they work, how do they interact, um, I, would, I would point you to this chapter here that Michelle and I wrote in the book that Carlos and I uh, edited a few years ago, which is really um, covers pretty much everything you ever wanted to know about what's in the culture medium and why. So, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions.
Once again, David, it was a great cutting edge science, as I said, and we would not expect anything less. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. I'm not sure whether you are aware, there is a paper that came out today from China indicating that the duration of storage of vitrified embryos affects the outcome. Meaning mm. that if you replace them after two years of storage, the chances will be less than after six months. And I had like a press release sent to me before it was published. And I, yeah. really, I, I, I was baffled as to what comment to make. Why? Because it is a, it is a serious stuff. Yeah. Something that came to save cryopreservation. To be, well, told, to be told that it has a lifespan and after that will be but why I ask this question, it's connection with any effect the antioxidant might have, if that is to be correct in improving the longevity of effect. Right. Yeah. right. I, I think I, I haven't heard of the paper. Um, that surprises me because at minus 196 degrees Celsius, life is stopped. Yeah. This, 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 you know, I, and I find that hard to reconcile that an embryo stored, whether it was vitrified or slow frozen, could deteriorate um, any more over time because nothing's happening at 196. I mean, literally time stands still. So I would have thought if, if there was a difference between vitrification and cryopreservation, we would have just seen it straight away. The duration of storage, I find that very difficult to reconcile and without knowing how they changed their protocols over time when they did it, because we know many things can impact that. Um, but I do think that you know, obviously that it's, as I alluded to, it's a very stressful physiological event in your life to be cryopreserved. So anything you can do to uh, support it, and it will be interesting to see. So I'd like to do a, a clinical study with the antioxidants to, to see if actually they do have a beneficial effect. Absolutely. It's also very encouraging that you are planning a randomized control trial to see it, the effect on success in yes. humans. Why I yes. say that? Because we have learned that mouse are just mouse. It's not human. With genome editing result that gave us yeah. totally paradoxical result with yeah. mice compared with human, probably yeah. caution will be urged. You know, the interesting thing is, um, if you go back through the literature, and you know, we've got close to 300 publications now, if you go back and track how we developed something like blastocyst transfer for the human, we didn't just do blastocyst transfer in the human. Oh. We developed all the, the basic work in the mouse. And then what people don't realize is we then did that work in the sheep and the cow. And we did embryo transfers in all of those. And that's when we were happy in the mouse, the sheep and the cow, we did pilot studies on donated human embryos. Yeah. Um, we then, did cell number analysis in a cell mass analysis on those donated embryos. Once we saw there was a beneficial effect, we did a pilot study of just a handful of patients to make sure the children were okay. And once we'd done the pilot study, we did a prospective randomized trial. And so we did all of this pre-work. And yet, even though we did that, we still get criticized that we just threw blastocyst culture at the world of IVF. And yet, if you go through the literature, it's probably the most thoroughly and systematically introduced piece of uh, technology. 
And so I agree completely with what you say. We have to do the pilot studies and then we have to have to do the prospective randomized trials, otherwise it's all for naught. So finally, about the in vitro culture system, where yeah. the, in vivo, the in vivo culture system that is being branded currently, where yeah. you put, yeah. Yeah, and then you put it inside the uterus, you take it out, it is counterintuitive because it is not the normal habitat at this stage to have no, the stage embryo. So any comment on that? That's a good question. I think um, it is counterintuitive. The, the data are, are, are good, but they're not as good as the best blastocyst transfer program. And, and I think they're good because they're, they're maintaining temperature and pH. And in the review that Whale and I wrote in Human Reproduction Update, we talk about <clears throat> the balance between stresses. And that one works because they've got good pH, they've got good temperature control, but it doesn't work as well as a really, really well-performing lab. But I mean, the good news is if you're you know, in, an, in a country where you don't have access to a good laboratory, uh, and if you think of some of the developing countries, then maybe this is a really suitable alternative because they don't have uh, the systems that you need to do all the things that I've just talked about. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good questions. Me done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David and Dr. Yaku, for uh, uh, the nice questions and answers. Um, actually, I have a, a tremendous amount of questions in the uh, in the website. I hope that we can um, um, make it simple and short answers. For uh, Dr. Shen, now we're asking about the role of IVM uh, prior to uh, IVF for uh, Dr. David. So the question is? It's about in vitro maturation. The room in vitro maturation of the oocytes. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of interesting work going on in this space. Um, Johann Smits in Brussels is, is really, really making us rethink this. Um, will it have a role in replacing IVF? I, I do not think so, no. But will it have a role for PCO patients, for example, who you could maybe avert you know, hyperstimulation and all of the things that, uh, that have just been discussed in the lecture before? Uh, possibly, yeah. And again, possibly in cases where uh, there is you know, people need to do a cheaper version of IVF if they have not got the resources. Um, I think it's kind of a niche market right now, but I think we need to watch carefully what Johan Smits is doing because he's a, he's a brilliant man and he's doing some very interesting things. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, in our country, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ali asked about uh, women insisting it to transfer more than one embryo or two or three embryos. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know the situation in Australia or in uh, London, St. Guys. So the question will be starting with Dr. Yaqub. Is there any women who insist on transferring more than one embryo? Of course, you will always find someone. But if you talk to them and explain to them that the other embryo is not going to be thrown to the cats, it is going to the freezer. It is going to the freezer. And rather than having all your embryos in one basket and pay the price for it later, have one them have as many embryos as you like, but one at a time. Yeah. Okay, Dr. David. I, I, I say exactly the same thing. I, you can have as many embryos back as you want, but one at a time. I think that's it. And the rest goes to be vitrified. So yeah, I, I recommend single embryo transfer, yeah. Uh, Dr. Umaima asking about the uh, optimum time of uh, um, uh, oocyte injection or denudation de after ovum pickup. Obviously to David. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So, yeah, denudation would do two hours after pickup and injection four hours after. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Four hours, four hours. Yeah. Dr. Sahar asking about the air jet in the embryo transfer catheter. Do you, do you see this uh, will um, increase the oxygen and that will may impair the uh, um, will increase the oxidative stress on the embryo for the um, air in the catheter, or you are using the connected column in the embryo transfer catheter? Yeah, we we have um, we have air columns in, <clears throat> but it's so transient. There's not enough time because actually, what's interesting, it takes a long time um, to, to to actually affect. Um, the medium in the catheter per se. So because of the volume and the, and the surface area that's exposed to the air, if you think about the column, you know, you have a column of medium and you've got an air gap just here. I mean, right. the, most of the medium is down here and it's not affected. 
So we don't see any problems with that. So uh, another question about the uh, oxygen um, um, uh, level. Uh, is there uh, any value for oxygen less than 5% in the uh, incubators? Good one. Less than 5%? Less than 5%. Ah, less than 5%. Less than 5%. That's a really good question. Um, certainly not for the cleavage stages. Um, we've done kind of, and, and several labs have done this where they've looked at dropping it down and down and down. Um, we've looked at a matrix every which way you can. And we've gone down 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, and when you get, when you look at it, it really, the combination comes out, the best combination we found was 5% for the cleavage stages going into 5% for the second phase. We didn't see any positive effects of lowering the oxygen below five. And in fact, if you get too low, you, you run the danger of, of setting off a lot of cascades and signals that you don't want to happen until post-implantation. So I, I wouldn't recommend it right now. Okay, I think Dr. Fauzi also uh, has proved this in his uh, clinical trial published uh, last year. Uh, for the COVID pandemic, um, what is the lab changes that you are uh, now uh, practicing? So is there any changes rather than the, uh, the, the past before the uh, COVID-19? For us in, for Melbourne? Um, for, the, for the lab, yeah. Yeah, for the lab, yeah. Uh, well, we're, we've been, we're back now. Uh, we've been back for a few weeks doing cycles. Um, obviously, patients are screened. Patients have their temperatures checked. Uh, patients wear masks. At uh, retrievals, we use full PPE. And uh, within the laboratory, um, we reorganize the laboratory to have greater space between every embryologist. So when they're working, so now there's two meters between everybody at the bench. Mm. So before they were quite closed in, now they're well parted. Right. Um, we are only allowed a certain number of people per square meterage. So we've reduced the number of people who are currently in a lab at, the, at any time. And we're just taking the precautions that the government offers. Yeah. So for the same, uh, um, uh, the same uh, issue, uh, do you switch off the uh, air condition in the lab? No, no, we don't. So, okay. Um, we have a bunch of questions about the use of antioxidants uh, in, mm. um, uh, in preparing the IOI uh, sample. So do you add the antioxidants in the IOI sample? No, not yet. That's, a, that's an ongoing uh, study. Okay. Yeah. A question regarding the uh, uh, preferred media you are uh, using in culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the clinic we have, uh, we do 4,000 cycles at, um, and to do that volume, um, we use GTL, we use a, a time-lapse medium. Um, but now we have a lot of isolates, we're re-looking at using G1, G2. So um, yeah, so we're, we're currently evaluating GTL and G1, G2. But for the, the majority of the cycles we're using GTL a time-lapse medium one system. Hmm. Another question about measuring the uh, pH in the, uh, in the uh, incubators. Do you mm -hmm. uh, do it uh, routinely and... Yeah, well, well uh, yes, we actually use um, several methods to do it and we would look at it at least every week. Every once week. A week. Yeah, I mean, we check incubators, you know, you do your assessments and gas analysis every right. day, but we check the pHs weekly. And the uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, do you uh, use them to uh, uh, select the embryos for transfer? The reactive oxygen species, do we use yeah. them to select? No. Uh, the oxidative stress to, to, to measure the... the... Oh, I was saying, right. Do, do. No. no, actually we don't. No, we don't. We use uh, other biomarkers. Our, our biomarkers uh, are based on the metabolism of the embryo. So we've been looking at uh, glucose utilization, amino acid turnover, and a few other things, but more based on uh, metabolic function. Okay. Okay. Um, a question about the uh, moving from static to microfluidic culture systems. Uh, do you yeah. recommend this? Well, it's experimental. Um, it's, it's experimental, but it holds great promise. 
um, because there's a lots of things you can do. If you think about it right now, we have one embryo sitting in one solution. Imagine just like we do in vivo in our bodies, we can uh, change the environment constantly, but we can also measure what the embryo is doing constantly. And there's lots of new technologies to help us do those kinds of analyses as well. So I think, you know, five years, the lab may look very different. Yes, Yeah. thank you. Um, I, I, a question about the uh, co-culture with endometrial or camel cells. Yeah, okay. Um, well, embryos co-cultured, no, the, we, we've looked at co-culture a lot in animal models uh, in the early days, so 30 years ago. And when the culture conditions were bad, or if we use 20% oxygen, then co-culture works really well. Um, and then we measured what was happening into the medium. And the two things that happened were, um, the cells were producing some nice amino acids and they were dropping the lactic acid, uh, they were dropping the oxygen concentration. And so when we realized that we, we, we stopped the co-culture and just dropped the oxygen concentration ourselves and used, used amino acids. So um, I have uh, uh, three questions regarding the safety of antioxidants on the health of the coming babies or the yeah. gene expression after that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, sorry, you said you have three questions? Uh, uh, all asking about the safety of antioxidants. Very good. Okay, so the two points. Um, the first one is, Reactive oxygen species at some levels are, are important for cell signaling. So when we looked at how much the peroxide, glutathione, how the levels of intracellular reactive oxygen change, you'd notice on the graphs, they went down. They didn't go to zero. We dropped them by about 25 to 30 percent. So there's still a lot of reactive oxygen there, more than enough to do cell signaling. Um, the gene expression, that's a great question. So what we've done and what we're just finishing the manuscript right now is we've done next gen sequencing on all those transfers that I talked about. So we did the transfers following culture at five and 20% with and without the antioxidants. And then we did next gen sequencing on all of those tissues and we compared them to the controls. And the data was really exciting to show that actually uh, the gene expression patterns uh, are more in vivo-like when you have antioxidants. So the gene expression patterns were very favorable with antioxidants. Thank you. Which is good news, uh, really good news. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Professor uh, Khalaf, about the um, um, question about the uh, PRP in the uh, intra ovarian injection and in the uh, uh, endometrial injection of uh, a platelet rich plasma in the uh, either in the ovary or in the endometrium. The answer is you simple. Think this? The answer mm -hmm. is simple. Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer. <laughs> and for you, Dr. David, yeah. uh, do you have any um, uh, uh, comment about the uh, platelet rich plasma intra ovarian or uh, uh, endometrial injection? No, no, I don't. This oh, thing okay. perfect. They so don't. Fake. It's something big. For uh, Dr. David, uh, what do you recommend, the dry or wet incubators? Very good. We use, we use dry incubators um, and with sufficient column of oil to prevent the osmolarity change. So we looked at this years ago just to make sure. And um, if you have sufficient oil, as recommended by the manufacturers of the dish, um, we don't see a change in osmolality that damages the embryo. So we use dry. So in all our labs, we use embryoscopes is our incubator of choice because we use a lot of time lapse and we use a lot of artificial intelligence with that data. You know, maybe next time I can talk about embryo selection and all, it, that is mind blowing what's happening in that field. Um, but yeah, so we, we wanted to use time lapse and now we use artificial intelligence in the lab. Perfect. Um, the next question about the uh, whether you are using continuous or uh, sequential media. Yeah, we currently use, as I said, uh, continuous, um, but we're re-evaluating a new sequential. So we're testing out a sequential system as well. Sequential system. Yeah. Um, an interesting question. Um, 
or uh, a comment about the FDA, male embryos consume more oxygen. Is that true? I said that. I expected that. Yeah. <laughs> I almost captured the imagination on this part of it. Uh, you know, I, I, I published a paper in 1987. Um, and we showed that female embryos consume more glucose than males. Um, and then we did that work again in America, in a mouse, and they, females did it. And then we repeated that work again in Australia again, and we found the same. So over 30 years, we've done this experiment many times, and each time we find that in the mouse, females take up more glucose than males. And one of the rationales for that is quite clear, is that prior to implantation, both X chromosomes are active. And so you have a different gene expression in a female blastocyst than in a male blastocyst. They are fundamentally different. And a lot of the enzymes involved in glucose metabolism are on the X chromosome. So the idea behind it is that females have more enzymes to metabolize glucose than the males. And when we looked at that in the human, and we published that in 2011, uh, 2011 uh, we saw that females actually consume more than males. So this whole point that there are differences between genders is, is real. I have an alternative explanation. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. This is an intelligent design, David. They are designed to be sweeter. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dr. Ashraf Kavali from Alexandria asking about if you are using uh, Dempsey free medium in plastic vitrification. I'm sorry, if we're using what? Uh, DMSI, D I M S I. Uh, um, DMSO free media. DMSO, DMSO, oh, yeah, DMSO, DMSO free. Yes, yes, we use propendial. Yeah, we use DMSO free. We use propendial. Okay, but DMSO works great too. So, Doctor Zayat asking about if you are using a group culture or a single culture, single in group culture. So, um, because we use time lapse dishes. They're technically individual cultures, but the wells are kind of connected. So it's a single culture, but with some communication. It's kind of a mix. It's not true group culture and it's not true single culture. If that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. So uh, Professor uh, um, um, uh, uh, Khalaf, uh, for the do you assess the endometrial receptivity using the uh, uh, ultrasound Doppler? No. As far as I'm concerned, Doppler has no place in assess conception. Yeah. Also, another uh, um, uh, attendee asking about adding antioxidant to the luteal phase, and we um, um, probably answered this question. There is no need for adding anything in the uh, um, luteal phase. For the, uh, the study mentioned, Dr. David, uh, Dr. Assam, uh, saying that there is no clinical information about the patient apart from age. Oh, yes, for the results that you have demonstrated about implantation yeah. rate in relation to age. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the younger patients don't seem to respond, um, but we get better embryo quality. So it's, it's interesting, but it's early days. I think, you know, we need to have this discussion when lots more labs have used it in, in 12 months from now and see what we need to do. Perfect. So uh, Dr. Amir asked about, does a fast developing embryo have a good or better prognosis than the one reaching the expected development? So if you are as yeah yeah first to, to be better yeah absolutely and Bob Edwards uh, Bob showed this in 1984 he published a paper in 84 um, showing that the faster cleaving embryos gave him more pregnancies and I think the rest of the world has just said yeah absolutely the question really is can you be too fast and yeah. and that we don't know could could you could you be bad if you go too fast and burn out but typically. Embryos that develop faster are better. Uh, a question about the, uh, um, uh, uh, your opinion about the uh, DNA fragmentation and testing for the uh, um, uh, DNA in the, uh, in the sperm. 
especially mm. in those with re, uh, repeated implementation. Yeah. Oh, it's a very good idea. It's an exceptionally good idea. Um, and I think there's some, there was a really nice present paper from um, Jean-Pierre Palermo's group where they were using uh, microfluidic devices to sort out uh, sperm with high DFI, DNA fragmentation from others and, and showing that their ICSI rates were much higher once you can identify who's got DFI and then do something about it. So uh, I think the data is very compelling that DFI is a problem. <clears throat> yeah. The only, okay, thank the, only you. Issue, the only issue, if you don't have that intervention, you are doing a test that you don't, you can't alter what happens afterward. If you are not exactly. using microfluidic, you are just causing yeah. the patient, it costs 500 pounds in the UK, which is a travesty. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and antioxidants, unfortunately, in male infertility, they remain an open question without any sure. concrete answer. So yeah. without an effective intervention, it remains experimental. Yeah, and, th and that's why I like Jean Piero's approach. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for you, uh, uh, Dr. David, and also for Dr. Akub, for patients with unexplained uh, repeated fertilization failure. Uh, what do you do in the uh, subsequent cycles for those couples? David. Unexplained, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, well, they're, they're difficult. I mean, you know, you, one has to consider uh, whether some form of egg activation might be irrelevant for them. Yeah. We all, so, we all adopt a trial and error, like mm. egg activation and whatever, calcium ionovore or any other agent, and it is hit or miss. It yeah, is not right. something that you can really tell the patient that you yeah. will be sure to get fertilization. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now um, I think, thank you very much, uh, professors, for this um, excellent talks and uh, excellent discussion uh, with uh, our attendees. I took the chance to announce for uh, our next webinar will be in Thursday, next Thursday, 7.30 uh, p.m. about the frozen embryo transfer with uh, Professor Yaqub and Professor uh, Richard Bolson, Professor Bedewi and uh, Professor Muhammad Sabri. I hope you uh, all enjoy this uh, uh, webinar and I hope that you find it fruitful for you and we are sorry for uh, being uh, uh, too late in Egypt and London and too early in Australia Thank you very much for you all, and we hope to see you in the uh, next Thursday. Thank you so much.